So we are on to the next talk, and we are honored to invite Professor Ziad Abedin to deliver his talk. Uh, Ziad uh, graduated in clinical biochemistry from the University of Manchester, and then from the Johns Hopkins University in public health. He is a professor of community health in the Faculty of Medicine of both El Quds and Toronto Universities, and the Anahari is director for over 25. He's, he has over 25 years of experience in academic teaching, research, and administration in public institutions. His background includes university teaching, research, and extension outreach as a public health specialist. He has been involved with NGOs work for more than uh, over 15 years. His uh, comprehensive knowledge and experience in health and development projects, leading strategic planning sessions, designing implementation plans, monitoring and evaluation projects, progress and impact, including assuming role in the management and technical project at local and international levels. His principal research interests are in the social, psychological, and behavioral determinants of mental and physical health and well-being, and on development of risk, risk behavior patterns among school children pertaining to nutrition, eating habits, and physical activity. He has been nominated as an international uh, educator of the year of 2006, he has conducted 17 national surveys on behalf of the Palestinian Ministry of Health and has published many reports, articles, monographs, and chapters in books. And he is on the editorial boards of two journals on nutrition and health. Um, the ad also chaired the National Committees for Food Fortification and Food Insecurity Task Force and is an advisor to the Palestinian Ministry of Health on nutrition monitoring. He has served consultant for the World Health Organization and the FAO in public health, and he has been the dean of research and graduate studies from, uh, for several years. So thank you very much, and we are honored to have you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> you are looking at a Palestinian who was born in Jerusalem, to a father who was 71 years old when I was actually born. Um, if that shocks you, my, when, he, when my sister was born, he was 76. <laughs> For those who are geneticists amongst you, I'm not a mutant, be assured of that. <laughs> I happen to be educated in Europe, by product of uh, British and American universities, came back to a, a region full of turmoil, and you might think, wouldn't you doubt my sanity working in this region? I think there might be a point. Today's presentation, if you realize, I'm also different from previous speakers. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I do know that if you have a point, you should make a PowerPoint. But I'm not, I'm, I beg to differ. The title of my presentation is about food security, food basket, and really collaboration across the divide. You might say, what the hell combines all this together? You'll see in a minute or two. In June till August 2002, a national nutritional survey called a nutritional assessment survey was conducted in the West Bank and Gaza. For those who don't know what is the total size of the West Bank and Gaza, it is less than 0.05% of the size of Canada. And that is statistically significant. You might say, why? The reason is we have more history than geography in this area. And that's probably one of the reasons why some people are interested in this region. Anyway, it, the total sample size was 4,500 households. The targeted population were women of childbearing age and children under five. Now, let me just give you a brief outcome or a brief account of the results at four different levels. Anthropometric measurements have shown 
that the global acute malnutrition was 7.8%, 13.3% in Gaza, and around 43 in the West Bank. While the global chronic malnutrition, that is something, it was around 11.7. Internationally, it's around 2.5, they say. That is the acceptable level. So you can imagine what's it like. Severe anemia was around 47%. Well, that's the anthropometric measurements. In terms of coping strategies, we, after looking at 16 indicators, and we looked at, in the end at the index, the coping mechanisms were almost totally ex exhausted. And the food insecure were accounted for 43%. The dietary intake, in terms of macronutrients, they were one-third below the RDA values, the recommended dietary allowances. 2002. In terms of micronutrients, all, I repeat, all of them were below the RDA values. I'm not really interested here to give a country profile about what was going on at that time. You should always think, it's not a matter of diagnosing, it's a matter of how do you address the issue. Alas, uh, the international community came to know about it, and we were inundated with the so-called consultants professionals. I don't believe any area has received so many like the West Bank and Gaza in the last 15 years. They parachute from the middle of nowhere, they come with their own ideas and their own background, and they tell you those are the, the way, or we prescribe it this way, and you should adhere to it. Have you ever seen a food basket that is gender and age specific? Does it address the needs of women, of infants and children? How many of them thought about the culture of that particular community? They just tell you, you add so much flour, so much oil, so much butter or margarine, and you have it. Is it balanced? Is it culturally appropriate? Nobody cares. They just tell you that's what it is. Donor countries and funding agencies, they do have the money. I think they are financially rich, but morally bankrupt. You might say, how come? Show me a single project funded by the World Bank or the IMF that is sustainable. I defy every single person around here who traveled extensively, who read different uh, uh, you know, policies or even diff about different projects, where there is one single project that has been accounted as a sustainable project. It is policy driven. There is always an agenda behind it. <coughs> well, what matters in the end, really, that's what I want to talk about. In light of such circumstances, turmoil, political turmoil, uh, you could say strife and what have you, how do you move forward? As a university, we have taken a decision. Do we perceive Israel as our enemy or as our neighbor? It's all a matter of perception in the end. We took the decision to perceive them as our neighbor. Hence. I do say clearly in front of everybody here, I spearheaded the collaboration, the academic collaboration between Israeli institutions and Al-Quds University, headed by Professor Sari Musaiba. Now, you might say, are you not afraid of mentioning it? Certainly not. Am I convinced about what am I doing? Certainly yes. And the clear indicator, the sustainability of the collaboration since 1996 has been ongoing.
in spite of the Gaza war, the despicable war, to, to the Americans, it's like 9-11. To the Palestinians, the Gaza war is, was a turning point. But in spite of that, we carried on. Because we believe we are neighbors and not enemies. Netanyahu might perceive us as enemies, but I beg him to think twice whenever he takes a decision vis-a-vis -vis the, what it's called, is it land security which is important, or is it food security? Peace is not the mere absence of war, but what contributes to the health and welfare of the communities in the area? This is very important. But secondly, I do know that politicians have been suffering from hearing loss for a long time. I do also know that they do response, they do respond more to heat than light, more to pressure. I also do know that we, as public health personnel, we think about the next generation. Politicians always think about the next election. But that's life. But that is life. So, how did we go about capacity building at Al-Quds University? You know, whenever you go for a funding agency, they come with that acronym SMART, S-M-A-R-T. You have to be scientific, the project has to be manageable, there should be achievable targets, with, it should be relevant with the time dimension. When I sat with some from the USAID, I asked them, have you ever thought about it from a different angle? I said, what are you talking about? Do they talk, do they ever reflect on what the term S means about sensitivity? Do we feel as neighbors we are secure? They don't think like us at all. Do we respect each other? Do we appreciate each other? Is the project which we are going to work on, is it of mutual interest to all of us? And above all, is there the element of trust? The secret of success of any collaboration is the acronym ART. Appreciation, respect, and trust. Amongst human relations, be it ma being married or otherwise, if one of those pillars is broken, the entire relationship is over. We have to think in a different way. So, I tell you what we benefited from terms of collaboration. I I'm going to talk about a particular journey that took place in the year 1999. I think the beginning of 1999. We thought of conducting the Haynes study, the health and nutritional examination survey. The Israelis thought about it. Of course, they have a better system. They are better funded. Looking at the Palestinians, this is, I mean, unthinkable. We were invited by the USDA. Three from the Ministry of Health of Israel. Two or three actually from Ben Gurion University, from, uh, headed by Professor Dora Fraser and two from the Palestinian side. We were subjected to a 10-day course about methodology, you know, we were given an overdose of so many other things, and in the end we were told to go back and to implement it. You wouldn't believe it. We sat together, we designed the questionnaire, we adopted the same methodology, and we started the, sale, the survey more or less on the same week over a year, it went on for a year. We finished on time and what we set forth as targets. I don't know about our Israeli colleagues whether they finished all their sample or not, but in the end we did it, we, we, we collaborated and we published together. So in terms of public aid, in terms of capacity building, what happened? Five levels. Personal development. We acquire the expertise in conducting surveys as complicated as the nutritional survey. Number two, we acquired, you know, the appropriate tools. You know, I know uh, researchers, they like their toys. We also like our toys, the appropriate tools in terms of databases, in terms of questionnaires, and so on. We were networking together internationally, regionally, and even at the local level. We published together. 
and above all, our policy makers, we know were no longer shooting in the dark. At least they were data driven. At least they were data driven. To conclude, food is not mere science. It is an agenda. Anybody who thinks otherwise is naive. With due respect, is naive. It is an agenda. People with good intentions, they receive little attention, especially from their policy makers. In the end, I would like to conclude by saying the following. If you evolve your attitudes, you'll be able to achieve a lot, in spite of the current political prevailing conditions. Mr. Chairman, I would admit one thing. I don't I mean, claim eloquency, but at least I claim punctuality. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Questions, please. You said that the various groups that have opposed the various programs and policies to try to bring a better nutritional or understanding of nutritional being Africa, Palestine, and Israel, they don't understand the culture. What, what would you now, what would you propose to do that would be able to get a positive understanding of it should be a participatory approach. They should not impose their, their views or their policies on the people who are targeted. I.e., I know beggars cannot be choosy, they say, but they should be respectful of our needs and should not impose. In other words, they should allow us to participate in any decision-making process. Can you give an example of yeah. where they pushed in one way and you felt that it was not that you would like to have done a different approach. Example, the basket, the food basket. They put flour, cooking oil, margarine, a little bit of sugar, and that was it. What are we well known in this area with olive oil? What are we also well known with our zata? Am I right or not? They never pay that. The micronutrients are far more, more important there. Secondly, why didn't they supply us with uh, fortified flour, fortified tahina? You know? Why? Many of the nutrient, micronutrient values would be there. So macronutrient, the macronutrients are not as important probably as the micronutrients from my point of view, especially for the children. In the end, I remember the FAO, when I happened to meet somebody who was enlightened a little bit in the sense that he said, well, we are willing to consider and, you know, to be flexible, to include something. They included Zata, for example, in their latest uh, basket, especially in the Gaza Strip, when they distributed the, you know, the food baskets. That's one of the issues. Secondly, I think if you want to allow me, there is a lack of element of trust. They think they know it all, and we are stupid, and we should follow what they tell us. This is arrogancy at its best. Your opinion. Thank you. The food basket, what do they put in it? Do they take into, uh, into consideration the needs of the infants or of the children? They don't. Or the elderly? They don't. It's a fixed menu, as it were. I'm awfully sorry, so you were on the receiving end. I'm sorry about that. Not only as far as the quality of the diet, but is it culturally acceptable? I've seen in camps where children have had diarrhea because the mother doesn't know how to cook pain. So definitely. But I don't think it's an ignorance about what you want to eat last week. I think it's more a political issue as what is available. Sorry if this is a bit sensitive, but it's actually what's available. I worked in Turkey also with uh, 
you can see this is the difference from what you see in Africa. You have a chocolate spread, you have milk, you have a basket that is more culturally accepted than nutrition and nutritious food. Nutrition values. So it's not an issue of they don't know what goes in there. It's an issue of, you know, what are your strategic issues there, what are the political reasons for why you are actually putting, um, uh, for example, uh, maize in the food basket for what's happening. If I may. I know you cannot generalize on people, especially people in general. Some of them are aware a little bit about our culture. But you can easily find out, you know, when you ask them, what, what is the most important, you know, uh, food we, we eat? They don't know anything about it. They think bread. That's it. Bread. Oh, yeah, we know the Middle East is not what it's bread. What else? That's what it is.